anyone out there who knows about poetry will not need me to tell them that I don't. This daily routine has been a wonderfully steep learning curve for me, and I'm genuinely grateful to people who've pointed out poems, most of which I've never read. With that in mind, I'm departing slightly from the usual format and reading two poems today, which I'm juxtaposing in order to contrast them. I know this is the sort of exercise that may well have put youngsters off poetry for life, and that I'm stretching a little knowledge dangerously taught, and it could all snap and crack me in the face, possibly take out an eye. Both poems are addressed to women whom the poets clearly want to bed. The first is John Clare's Meet Me in the Green Glen, sent to me by Alan Howe. And the second is my choice of Andrew Marvell's famous poem To His Coy Mistress. Clare's highly insistent dating technique is more a a note with a cross on a hand-drawn map than it is a romantically persuasive pleading. They've met in the Glen before. This isn't the first time. And I get the sense that he feels describing the botanical setting is all the wooing required of him. He does say she must come alone, which may explain why they've not made much progress to date. It's a beautiful poem, though, and short enough to fit in the other. Marvell is much more guileful sort of seducer, a lounge lizard, really, where Claire seems already three-fourths a husband rather than frenzied lover, Marvel is after sex. He is plainly bent on deflowering and marshals the argument familiar to women in wartime and possibly during pandemics that it's me or the worms will find a way in. Meet me in the green glen. Love, meet me in the green glen beside the tall elm tree where the sweet briar smells so sweet again there come with me meet me in the green glen meet me at the sunset down in the green glen where we've often met by hawthorn tree and fox's den meet me in the green glen meet me in the green glen by sweet briar bushes there Meet me by your own sen, where the wild thyme blossoms fair. Meet me in the green glen. Meet me by the sweet briar, by the molehill swelling there. When the west glows like a fire, God's crimson bed is there. Meet me in the green glen. To his coy mistress. Had we but world enough and time, this coyness, lady, were no crime. We would sit down and think which way to walk and pass our long love's day. Thou by the Indian Ganges side shouldst rubies find. I by the tide of Humber would complain. I would love you ten years before the flood. And you should, if you please, refuse to the conversion of the Jews. My vegetable love should grow vaster than empires, and more slow. A hundred years should go to praise thine eyes, and on thy forehead gaze. Two hundred to adore each breast, but thirty thousand to the rest. An age at least to every part, and the last age should show your heart. For, lady, you deserve this state nor would I love at lower rate. But at my back I always hear time's winged chariot hurrying near, and yonder all before us lie deserts of vast eternity. Thy beauty shall no more be found, nor in thy marble vault shall sound my echoing song. Then worms shall try that long-preserved virginity and your quaint honour turned to dust, and into ashes all my lust. The grave's a fine and private place, but none, I think, do there embrace. 
Now, therefore, while the youthful hue sits on thy skin like morning dew, and while thy willing soul transpires at every pore with instant fires, now let us sport us while we may, and now, like amorous birds of prey, rather at once our time devour than languish in this slow chapped power. Let us roll all our strength and all our sweetness up into one ball, and tear our pleasures with rough strife through the iron gates of life. Thus, though we cannot make our sun stand still, yet we will make him run. Leave behind your troubles in life, go 